There's a few traditions that we try to do in the Masterworks week. One, we call the grade nine students by their last name. And also, we have a beautiful statue here that was donated by Mr. Ian Henley, who's with us today, which is wonderful. And uh, it represents the student flying, dangling from the wings of an eagle. <laughs> so uh, it's tradition for the students to touch this before they do their Masterworks presentation for good luck. So I would like to present to you Mr. Ben Foster. Hello. Have you ever watched a movie or seen a commercial? Of course you have. But the real question is whether you've wondered how the part in the movie is made, where the man flies through the air, or the car explodes. My name is Ben Foster, and I'm going to be talking to you about the art of visual effects. So what started me on my path? When I was little, my family watched a lot of movies. I'm not talking about them leaving me in front of the TV for hours. I'm talking about them showing me their favorites and discussing them with me. They told me who their favorite actors were and what type of car it was in a movie. And I thought this was all fine and dandy, but I never understood how the parts in the movie were made. I watched the movie Iron Man when I was about seven years old when it was released. I loved the movie and my mom told me who Robert Downey Jr. was. I asked if there was a real suit that could make me fly, shoot lasers, etc. But once I realized it was animated, it opened my mind to the world of animating. I didn't do much with animation except for little flip books up until grade three where I took a camp on claymation. This was my first experience with any form of real animation on the computer and, and I really liked it. I liked making the clay people and the objects and the storyboard, but what I really liked was taking the pictures and stringing them all together on the computer. I didn't really do anything after this with animation modeling until last summer. Knowing masterwork was coming and that I had to choose a project quickly, naturally, I procrastinated until my mom picked one for me. <laughs> Next thing I knew, I was in a modeling and animation camp with Mateus and Devin. In this camp, we used a program called Blender to do basic modeling and animating. But once the year started, I took up a different course with my advisor, Daniel Roisman. And he started me on a program called Maya, which I'll talk about later. This basically kick-started me off into my modeling and visual effects adventure. So now I'm going to be talking about the history of VFX. I'm going to start talking about the beginning. Not the very beginning, but the beginning of visual effects and editing movies. Movies have been around for over 100 years, 114 to be exact, and they've come a really long way from where they've started. In 1902, George Miles, a French illusionist and filmmaker, made a 15-minute French silent film entitled Le Voyage dans la Lune. The film actually had a story, and it's very famous for even today. A Trip to the Moon had 30 different scenes and was the first long-form film of its kind. 1917, a film called The Gulf Between was released. The reason this film is so special is because it used Technicolor. This was a huge step forward in films we see today which have both color and sound. 1964 is when Walt Disney Studios released Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins won an Oscar for visual effects because it beautifully blended live action with animation. It was a remarkable achievement in filmmaking and audiences had never seen anything like it. At the time, combining live action film and a superimposed animated layer was still a new concept, but Mary Poppins really succeeded in using it. 1967 is when VFX really started to appear in film, after a 10 minute computer animated film called Hummingbird was released. The film was made by a man named Charles Kasuri. This was important because it marks the beginning of computer based animation. The animation was programmed as motions into a computer software, and then the computer drew it on the screen. 1967 is when a film called Future World by Richard T. Heffron came out. This film used 3D CGI to animate someone's hand and face. This is the first time this was used and was a big advancement in film. While 3D CGI and computer animation were occasionally used after Future World, it really wasn't taken to its full potential until 1995 with the release of Pixar's Toy Story. Apart from being a great movie, Toy Story is regarded as the first 100% 3D animated film. 
what does the movie industry use visual effects for? In any high budget movie, or even lots of low budget movies, I guarantee you've seen some form of visual effects. The movie industry uses visual effects to do variety of things, but how I explain it is visual effects is used when you can't do it in real life or a motion picture, or live motion picture. For an example, in Iron Man, they didn't actually make a big iron suit. Instead, they made a mask and then put markers over Tony Stark. Then they would, um, then they aren't restricted to doing things in the suit, like jumping, flying. So they could just animate over it and have the markers as set places to add models to. A technique for doing this is by adding markers on the actor so the animator can track what the actor's doing and animate over it easier. What I mean by this is that the animator doesn't have to make new models and change it every time the actor moves. Instead, he can attach it to the animator, or to the actor, as the scene goes. This is a scene from The Lord of the Rings, and here's Benedict Cumberbatch with all the markers on his face, and they turned him into Smog the Dragon. But now what I use visual effects for. And now, you know, the effects. I've been talking a lot about animation, and surprisingly, that isn't what I'm doing. Animation means to have a model that moves and to record it, but I'd have to have a video or a GIF of some other type of visual. But what's different with what I've done was with my project, it's making still shots. These are usually made, used to make posters or covers of things. This means that there's no movement, there's no animation, it's just making a scene. This is a lot easier because then I didn't have to track the object I'm moving in, with in the video in the background. Instead, I can simply make my desired model and then have my image. This is where Maya and Nuke come in. Maya's for the modeling and Nuke is for the actual image part, for touch-ups and adding things to the final shot. What's Maya? Maya is a program that is made for modeling, animating, and designing whatever your heart desires. It has so many possibilities with all the tools that it includes. You can work with anything from particles, meaning little dots and specks of light that come out of one spot that you can control, to things like a skeleton for a character that you've modeled to control it and help it move during the animation process. It can also make things like shapes and structures. Essentially, you start out with a block and you can bend and morph it to your every wish. You can do things like take edges off and sculpt the block until you're happy with it, and it ends up looking nothing like the block anymore. That's what modeling is. But a more in-depth um, explanation of modeling is making a shape and editing it to whatever you like it to be. Th but this is before you add color and texture, before you add movement or anything else. Modeling is simply just editing your start starting shape into anything you want it to be and whatever you can think of. A lot of people use modeling for making designs before they actually go for a final project. So they might make one or two or even three models as drafts before they add finishing touches because adding those finishing touches is an equal amount of work. What's texturing? What's texturing? I've talked a lot about texturing and it may sound complicated, but it's actually very simple. It's a lot along the lines of coloring your model, but instead of using one solid color for all of it, you just repeat an image over and over. This is extremely use useful and used a lot in the animating industry. For example, if you're animating a brick wall, you don't wanna color every brick in there. You, wanna, you don't wanna make a bunch of bricks. Instead, you'll make a flat wall and then add a texture of a brick wall over it. <laughs> um, but what's Maya used for? It's made to accelerate 3D animation, video games, and artistry. It is used in the movie and video game industry all the time. It's a program that can do so many things, so it's usually used somewhere down the pipeline. Surprisingly to me, when I searched what industries, what games, what movies use Maya, I couldn't get a straight answer because everyone just says it's used somewhere in their process. Now, what's Nuke? <laughs> Compos Nuke is a compositing program. Compositing is something that took me a while to figure out. The definition is combining two or more images together to make a single one. It sounds very simple, but there are so many options, it actually makes it pretty complicated. Nuke is a program for making compositing and after edits. 
but what's it used for? Layering images is pretty simple. All you have to do is put one image on top of the other. But blending images together is where it gets pretty difficult. I didn't really experiment with layering, but I know that it's used for things like having a faded photo on top of another photo. This is done in a lot of images that are supposed to be dramatic or intense, but in my opinion just looks really cheesy. <laughs> so now this is my experience in the Yumi Academy with Daniel. The Yumi, you, in the Yumi Academy classes, we learned a variety of things about Maya. Nearly every class was different, and aside from being really fun, I learned a lot. In the first class I had, I learned about cameras and what they can do. Daniel taught me about static and animated cameras. The difference between them is that static cameras mean to stay still, so it's just a camera that aims in one direction and records. But animated cameras are a lot more fun. There's a lot more options. You could set up a camera to continuously point at your model when it runs around. Or you could even make your camera move around your model. The possibilities are really endless. This is used a lot in the industry because nobody really wants to just have one single movement. After this, we learned about particles. Particles are pretty simple, but you can do a lot with them. They're made from one point, which is called a particle emitter, and you can edit them from there. You can edit things like their color, where they go, how fast they go, when they die, and how many are made per frame. We learned about fluids in the next class. Fluids are a mass that fill a set area and are used as anything that is a liquid or a gas. With fluids, you can do a variety of things, such as change the density, pressure, color, and quantity. You can imagine what changing the color is, obviously, but changing the density means to make it thicker or thinner. Changing the pressure, just how fast it goes away from the generating point, and the quantity is how much is generated. I also learned about joints. I learned about how to put them in your models and connect them. Putting them is in isn't all that hard. First, you start with the middle of the hip and then go up, up, up until you get to the head. And then you do one arm. I'm only do you only do one arm because you mirror it so that it automatically does it on the other side so that you don't need to do it twice and make a mistake. So you model an arm, hands, fingers, etc., then your leg. And then you connect the hip bone to the middle and then the shoulder bone to the middle. And then you've got a finished skeleton. In the last class I went to, we learned about paint weights. This connects to joints because it's made for how moving certain joints affects the model. This means that when you move a joint, it will most of the time affect a large area of the model. So what paint weights is, is editing how much that joint movement affects your model. A different and easier way to describe this is like masking tape when you're painting. When you paint, you put masking tape so that the paint doesn't touch what you don't want to be painted. In this case, the masking tape is black on the model and white is where it's affected. The darker the shade is, the less movement there is. And the lighter the shade is, the more movement there is. As you can see in the first picture, it's gray here and you don't want that affected. When you move, my bad. When you move your hand, you don't see that skin moving. Instead, you see this skin moving. And in, it's not in between the fingers here, but it is there. So when you do move the finger, uh, different parts are affected. Now I'm going to be talking about my process. In the beginning of my project, I went through the process of thinking what I was going to make. Naturally, I thought big. I thought of making a giant boulder crushing one of my friends from school, or a massive bee's nest in the middle of the street. But then I realized that's far too difficult, and I really don't like bugs. I was looking one day on the interweb, and I found some inspiration seeing a hole in the ground graffiti art. This interested me and sparked me the idea of making a hole in visual effects. I went through many different types of holes, from cracks in the ground to rabbit holes to rectangular chute that looks like it goes to the center of the earth. I ended up picking the rabbit hole because it's pretty classic and probably the easiest. But since I wasn't very experienced with Maya and modeling at the time, the hole was never finished. Then I started making textures and learned that it was extremely easy. Here's an example of a simple concrete one I made. I just took three pictures of concrete and then put them together in the paint program and then you can put it around any model you'd like that you want to look like concrete. You obviously don't want a person painted as concrete. But recently I've made a snake and I have a time lapse of it. 
I went through three different tries with the snake, but I was happy with the third one. The first one was fat and didn't have enough twist or anything. When I smoothed it, when I smoothed it out, it looked even worse. The second run through wasn't that bad, but well, that bad. It looked like a garden snake, but it didn't have enough zigzag, and the head was far too big for the body. Um, I separated making the final snake into three parts, making the body, the head, and the tongue. Altogether, this took about three hours, or two hours, my bad. As you can see here, I take a simple cylinder and then cut it up and take the end of it to make the tail. It takes me a while to smooth it out because I'm not the smartest guy. But um, eventually I make it into a point and then thin it out in the back because I don't want a fat snake again. So I take the, one of the sections here, or three of the sections, and I move one out, one that way, and then the other this way. So it does have a zigzag. I then thin it down because, again, who wants a fat snake? I make the face smaller so that I have a base for a face. In this next video, I do the face and the texturing. As you can see here, I start selecting the face and I start making the jaw bigger and little dents for where the eyes will go. I then change the color here and the textures. You can't see me changing it because it didn't record um, the side, but I changed the textures with, instead of the yellow one, which I didn't like, I think it's yellow, to the brown one, which I did like. I then made one eye and made it into a slit like snakes have, and then I doubled it and copied and pasted it, so I don't make them, so they're the same. I don't make a mistake twice. <laughs> I then I then realized I didn't like the mouth at all, so I kind of made it smaller and experimented with it. In in this video, I made the snake tongue, which was, in my opinion, the hardest for sure. Oh no! There we go. Sorry. I start out with a simple triangle, and then I start cutting away so that I can make the fork shape that snakes have. And then I bend it and put it up, and this was actually annoying because I didn't know what to do. I bended it up, and then I took the bottom and squished it a bit so that it was thinner. And once I got that figured out, I made a, root, a cut loop around it, and then made a zigzag in the tongue so that it doesn't look like one straight line. I then added the color red to it and put it in the snake's mouth. Once again, I decided I do not like the mouth and there was a little glitch that wouldn't let me just close it so I had to use the skin around it and push it down. I then realized I didn't like the eye because I'm picky <laughs> and I had to change that one too. So this is the finished snake. As you can see, there's a cut in the mouth that wasn't supposed to happen but there is enough zigzag, it isn't too fat, it's got a decent sized head. Okay, it's a bit lumpy, but it, it's, 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 I like it. I like it a lot. Um, but yeah, this is the finished snake when I smooth it out and textured it. And now this is what I plan to do after Masterworks. In conclusion, I've loved my Masterworks experience, and I've had a lot of fun learning about visual effects and the special effects world, and it's taught me so much. My favorite part of the whole thing was probably seeing before and after pictures and looking at the infinite things you can do and make from just one basic shape. I've always loved computers and making things from scratch, but what I've realized through this process is that I'm interested in a different path. I love the possibilities with computers, but I'm more interested in working with things that are tangible and something you can hold, feel, and use. I still love the elements of having a basic start and then ending up with something amazing and completely different. I would like to learn a trade, like working with metal, wood, or mechanics. I'm not sure what I want to do yet, but I'm going to explore in the next few years through electives in high school and with my family. I love making things and seeing a finished product, but I, just, I guess I just wasn't looking in the right place. I've learned that digital work may not be my thing, but instead working with real materials and being able to see my work in real life instead of through a computer screen. Don't get me wrong, I love computer screens. <laughs> I think that the ultimate goal will be able to work with both and incorporate the two by designing my project on the computer and then building it in real life. It would be great to be able to do both and see my project before I actually build it.
So now I'd like to say thank you to my external advisors, Daniel Roisman and John White, for dedicating their time and teaching me a lot and helping me complete this great project. I would also like to thank my internal advisor, Christian McKennis, for also reminding me about deadlines, editing my paper, and helping me through this adventure. I would also like to thank my parents for supporting me and helping me stay sane and get the, getting things done most of the time. <laughs> and I'd like to thank you for being a wonderful audience. And I would like to now make an important announcement that Ben Foster has completed all the requirements of the Island Pacific School of Masterworks program. Yeah.